If you want to grab a quick cup of coffee, the coffee is over here. You can help yourself. If you want a quick cup of coffee this morning, so good to see all of you here. Praise God. Josiah, my man, I am so happy to see you this morning. So everybody wave at my most handsome son up there in the sound booth. I know he's gets super embarrassed, but just to see him, Josiah, you've encouraged my heart. Let me tell you why. So a lot of times when there's things that are going on in the body of Christ, it, I, it manifests physically in my body. I feel it literally physically. And so yesterday I began to feel some, my feet started with my right foot, began to just cramp up. And then my left foot began to cramp up. And when things like that happen out of nowhere, I know that the Lord is speaking to me. Maybe it is because he has to be extreme to get my attention. Nonetheless, I know that uh, when, when you think about a cramp in the body, uh, those things have to do with your nerves, right? How many of you ever had a Charlie horse? Okay, a Charlie horse, like a cramp, a sudden cramp. It comes from your nerves, right? So I know, I know that the enemy's plan, because we're not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his schemes. And we know that in this season, he is trying to get your nerves all balled up, right? He's trying to make you feel a little bit of tension in this season that we're in. And so I knew as a confirmation, because you need to learn that the Bible will always give you it says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything is established. That is why scripture talks about the two witnesses. Amen? And so this morning, I go to wake up the kids, and Josiah is like, Mom, I've got this terrible cramp in my back. Started all through the night. It's this Charlie horse in my back. I can't move. I, and I knew immediately I knew immediately that was my second witness. So I want you to know that even though the enemy would love for your nerves right now to be all balled up, I want you to know that the Lord is faithful. He is on the throne. And I want you to know that before you leave today, the word of God is going to ignite you. It's going to inspire you. It's going to give you a, a revelation of truth. Amen of truth. Why is truth vital? Because it's the truth that does what? Come on, help me preach. It's the truth that sets us free. Amen. So this morning, pastor and I are going to be tag teaming a little bit. So I do, as I got up this morning, God began to just download to me uh, a truth and a principle about in enlightened warfare. Okay, not just warfare, but the adjective which describes it is called enlightened. Can you say enlightened? Okay, in other words, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. So this morning, the Lord is going to show us biblically and scripturally his heart. So we're going to open up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful day that you've made. This is the day that you've made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, God. We thank you, Lord, that you're on the throne. Jesus, that you are, you are seated. You are seated. You are seated at the right hand of God. And you ever live to make intercession for us. You're praying for us now in this moment, Jesus. We're so thankful, so grateful that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. We have a high priest who's gone before us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are interceding for your bride. And truly, everything you've declared in your word will come to pass. So, Father, I thank you. You are sovereignly, you are sovereignly anointing our eyes with eye salve this morning. Sovereignly, God. Sovereignly. You are anointing our eyes with eye salve, God. And you are aligning our heart. And you are purifying your bride. 
because you're ready and you're excited and you are anticipating that great and glorious, beautiful day when you return back to this planet to receive your bride. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. I want to begin this morning in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Here, these words are in red in my Bible because these are the words of Jesus. And Jesus here is going to break down a revelation of prayer. How many of you know that prayer changes things? Do you believe in prayer? Raise your hand if you believe in prayer. So here Jesus is saying, in this manner or this way, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, come on, are you living on planet earth today? On earth, on earth, on earth, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. Beloved, this morning, the mandate, the mandate, the blueprint, the destiny of the church is from heaven. It doesn't come from media. It doesn't come from a political party. It doesn't come from man. The mandate, the calling, the blueprint, the destiny comes from heaven. It's very important that you understand that. Now, this is Jesus saying, this is how you need to pray. That the kingdom of God will come and manifest upon the earth. The kingdom of God is the domain of the king. Amen? The kingdom is the domain of the king. Now, it says, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation. Pause right there. When Jesus walked his life out on earth, was there a time that he was tempted? As soon as he was baptized, beloved, when he came up from those baptismal waters, as soon as he was baptized, Scripture tells us he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. Tested. And in that place of testing, how did he overcome? He said, come on, help me preach this morning. What did Jesus say to the enemy? He said, it is written. Just let that roll off your tongues this morning. Come on, say, it is written. So if we're biblically ignorant, we will lose the battle. Because Jesus clearly showed us this is how you fight. It is written. It is written. It is written. This is how we fight, beloved. The weapons, listen to me, this is important. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not physical. Amen? The sword is our weapon. The sword is our weapon. So Jesus is clearly saying that the mandate and the heart and the destiny of God is that the kingdom of God will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Heaven is closer than you think. Heaven is closer than you think, beloved. Heaven is closer than you think. And if you're waiting for someday, when it's time to go home, 
for your mansion in heaven. Beloved, I want you to know when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, he was going to the cross. So Jesus the carpenter is not up there making a mansion for you. A mansion is an abode. It is a dwelling place. Jesus was the mansion of the Father. You are the mansion of God. You are the house of God. He lives in you. Amen? Do you believe it? How could something natural have to do with an eternal inheritance? It says, my faith, which is much more precious than gold, that perishes. Your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is written. It is written. I want everyone to just stand up for the reading of the next passage in Proverbs. This is why the warfare that we are engaged in today is so critical. We need to understand this because this is where we begin. This is where we begin in our foundations of understanding who this great and mighty God is. Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19. This is the New King James Version, and I want every one of us to read this out loud together. All right, here we go. It says, these Six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. You may be seated. This is my Jesus. This is my God. This is the creator of the universe. This is his heart. Why does it matter to even engage yourself in this warfare that's going on over our nation? Why does it even matter? Because clearly, beloved, in Proverbs it says, there are things that the Lord hates. Just let that stew for a minute. There are some things that the Creator God hates. There are some things that are an actual abomination to Him. And he lays them out very clearly, seven things. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. The warfare that we are engaged in, beloved, has absolutely nothing to do with a political party. The battle that we are engaged in is a spiritual battle. The battle that we are engaged in is the lie against the truth. It's the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. Are you listening to me this morning? There are things that the Lord hates. He hates it. The shedding of innocent blood. It's clear. The Bible is clear. He hates the shedding of innocent blood. So why is the battle so intense? Why is the battle so intense? Beloved, 
because the Lord is preparing his bride. Scripture tells us that the bride makes herself ready. And the bride of Jesus Christ cannot form a covenant or be in agreement with a spirit of death. We cannot, we cannot be in agreement with a spirit of death. Amen? Now, is there anything in the Bible that teaches that your prayers can be hindered? Is there? Yes or no? So if our prayers can actually be hindered, we better learn. We better study. We better dig into the book and figure out, God, what could cause my prayers to be hindered? I don't know about you, but I want a direct line to the throne of God. Amen? As a nation, as America, as a nation, beloved, what do you see in the future? Do you see a glorious church arising and revival and evangelism, signs, wonders, miracles, the power of God? The glory of God on display. Do you see it in the future? Can you see it? Beloved, how many of you have loved ones who are not saved? Right? We all have loved ones, neighbors, coworkers that are not saved. And we are desperate to see them ripped out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Amen? Amen? We are desperate to see revival. Beloved, when revival breaks out, the greatest mark is going to be evangelism. We are going to see household salvations. We're going to see the miraculous power of God on display. We're going to see miracles, signs, wonders. But there is something that can hinder our prayers for our nation. Isaiah chapter 1. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 1. We already know that the Lord hates the shedding of innocent blood. Isaiah 1 here. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15. It says, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Why? 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 Why will he not hear? Why? What does it say, beloved? Your hands are full of blood. Thus far, beloved, because we have allowed, because we have agreed with abortion being legalized in our nation, thus far, we, our hands, have been full of blood. But I have good news for you, beloved. The church of Jesus Christ has thrown herself upon the altar in repentance. Amen? We have thrown ourselves upon the altar of repentance. We have broken our heart before God. We have acknowledged our sin before the creator God, the one who says, I hate the shedding of innocent blood. I hate it. Why do we think he would validate someone who agrees with the shedding of innocent blood? Why? Where is heaven's agreement today? 
Where is it? It is upon life and the womb that is holy. Amen? Now, we have been in Isaiah 115. We have turned the page and we have stepped into Isaiah 16. It says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. This is where we are as a nation. We are washing ourselves. We're cleaning ourselves. We're trying to put away the evil of our doings. We are ceasing from doing the evil. We're learning to do good. We're going to seek justice. We're going to rebuke the oppression. oppression. We're going to defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. Because, beloved, if we don't break our agreement with the shedding of innocent blood as a nation, as a nation, I'm not talking about individuals. There is always a remnant. Amen? There's always a remnant. There's always a remnant. Sometimes you may feel like Elijah. Elijah was like, oh, God, I am the only one left. Don't you feel like that sometimes? God. I'm the only one left standing, believing that there can be a miracle in our nation. And God says, oh, don't worry. I have 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Do you not understand across this nation? He has those who will not bow their knee to Baal. Do you believe it? You're not alone. Just tell your neighbor we're not alone. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Defend the fatherless. Beloved, do you understand what the fatherless is? That is an orphan. But an orphan is not just a child who has lost their parents. An orphan is a child who is not wanted. So all of these pregnancies that are not wanted, we are to defend. So what happens? Let me just pose this question. What happens if abortion is no longer legal and these women are not allowed legally to have an abortion and they give birth to these babies. Now, we pray that some of them will turn, their hearts will turn towards that child. But beloved, many of them, they are still not going to want to raise the baby. What are we going to do as a church? What are we going to do as a church? How wide open is your heart? Are we going to back up our beliefs with action? Look down the road with me, beloved, because there will be a change in our nation with or without you. The Lord has spoken. He hates it. The Lord has spoken. He hates it. The Lord has spoken. He hates it. So I encourage you to begin to pray, God, expand my heart, Lord Jesus. Let me be your hands and feet that I can defend the fatherless with actions, not just words. Now, so how do we fight in this battle, beloved? We know the posture of God's heart. Let's go to Paul, and let's learn from Paul this morning how we are not going to fight. We know, beloved, if we continue down the path with our hands full of blood as a nation, our prayers will be hindered. So we must turn. We must turn our prayers. We don't want our prayers to be hindered. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. 
It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Are you uncertain today? Shake it off. Come on, just shake it off in the fire. Just go ahead, let it burn. We're not running with uncertainty. Go ahead, shake it off. I don't run with uncertainty. Thus, I fight, not as one who beats the air. We are not just beating the air, beloved. We are not fighting for victory. This is so important, beloved. We are fighting from victory. There's a big difference. We are not trying to go and take back what the devil stole. Jesus did that. Jesus did that. Jesus did that. So what do we do? Are you ready? Are you ready? You enforce his victory. You enforce his victory. We are enforcers. What did he say? Occupy. Do business until I come. Occupy. We are called to enforce his victory. Now, this may shake you up a little bit, but I know that we've been taught that the coming of the Lord is any minute. The Bible doesn't teach the coming of the Lord any minute. It teaches until, until, until. So where does the teaching of him coming any minute, where does it come from? Beloved, there are so many teachings that we've built our lives upon that is not sound doctrine. The devil is a master at taking scriptures out of context and using those for his own agenda. We are gawking at the world who's taking things out of context, and we do it in the church. Let me tell you one. We preach and teach and believe that women cannot preach because we take a scripture and we build a doctrine. We take a scripture and we build a doctrine. Yet... The truth, the whole counsel of God clearly validates women as a mouthpiece for God. Amen? It is understand that Satan came and he used scripture. He said, if you are the son of God. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Because after all, the scripture says he will command his angels charge over you. He uses scripture for his own agenda. So the belief of any minute because they take the passage of scripture that says he comes suddenly like a thief in the night. You, you've heard that, right? Amen. He comes suddenly like a thief in the night. Read the rest of the passage. It says, but for children who walk in the light, he will not overtake you like a thief in the night. He only surprises the wicked. The wicked are surprised. The wicked are surprised. The Bible teaches there are some things that must happen. It says he must remain in heaven until the restoration of all things, until his enemies are made his footstool. 
until the bride makes herself ready. Ask your neighbor, are you ready? Now ask him this, have you broken your agreement with death? Until, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, I'm almost done. Acts chapter 3. He surprises the wicked. Acts chapter 3. So the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. We hasten his return. Acts chapter 3, verse 18 through 21. It says here, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come. Where? From the presence of the Lord. Do you need to be refreshed today? Just go in his presence. Just go in his presence. Just go there. Do you need to be refreshed? Just go to his presence. How do you get in his presence? You worship, right? You worship. That's how you get in his presence. You worship. And that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive. Give me the word. Until. Until what? Until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophet since the world began. If you have to scare someone into the kingdom, you're going to have to keep them scared to keep them saved. Any doctrine, listen to me, any doctrine based on fear is not of God. Any doctrine based on fear, is not of God. Amen? Until the restoration of all things. What is going on in our nation? The Lord is sovereignly restoring all things so that the bride can make herself ready so that he can return back and receive his bride. Until the restoration of all things. Acts chapter 2, verse 34. It says, David did not ascend into heaven, but he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until, there it is, until I make your enemies your footstool. The church of Jesus Christ is the second witness. We are the second witness. And until we can put death under our feet, he cannot return. Did Jesus conquer death? Just answer that, yes or no. When he resurrected, did he conquer death? Now you and I are called to enforce that victory. He conquered death. He conquered death. He conquered death. The bride cannot stand in agreement with the spirit of death. Are you listening to me? It is more, it's not about a political party, beloved. I want you to know there is something greater going on. The bride is making herself ready. And I want you to know, beloved, the story is not over. 
the story is not over. I don't care what the news is saying. The story is not over. I'm going to pass the mic. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Won't you all stand? Jeez, Sarah, after that, I kind of felt like, thus saith the Lord, right? You could feel the presence of God. Just lift your hands. Let's just enjoy the presence of, of the Lord as he has spoken a word in season to us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We believe the prophets, God, and so we shall prosper and succeed we believe the prophetic word of the Lord this morning, God. We come into agreement and alignment with our prayers, with our faith, Lord, and with our declarations, God, that we will believe the report of the Lord. We thank you, Father. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. So if you can unplug that, I guess this isn't working. Just keep that simple this morning. Just unplug the black piece there. There you go. Hey, Amen. Well, um, just that black piece on the side. Oh. Amen. So this morning I want to share for a title, it's called Young Children. Well, actually, we'll backtrack. It's called Children, Young Men, and Fathers. Children, Young Men, and Fathers. Uh, So we'll start with 1 John chapter 1, and uh, then 1 John chapter 2, and then I'll, I'll share what's on my heart. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 1 says, and I'm sorry, 1 John 1, uh, chapter 1, so 1 John 1, verse number 5, it says, this is the message which we have heard from him. This is from the Lord Jesus Christ, directly from the throne room of grace, and we declare it to you. Well, what is that word? That God is love. It didn't say that. It says God is light, right? So in our generation, thank you, Jesus, we have heard about God's love. We've heard very little bit, very little about God's light. So this morning, I want to talk about uh, the light or from that perspective of God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness Let's just make it plain, John. He says, you're a liar. He says, we lie. If you are continuing to walk in darkness, doesn't mean you don't slip up every now and then, but if you continue to walk, that your walk is in darkness, then you are in a lie and you're living a lie. It says, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one or with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, not some, but all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2. So just turn the pages in your Bible, or if you're reading it on your phone, just look at the next chapter, verse number 12. It says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. 
I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So this morning, there are four kinds of people that are listening to me and listening to this message, and we eventually post this uh, to YouTube as well. So we get people from all over the United States and sometimes even the world that will hear uh, these messages. So there are four types of people, four kinds of people that are listening this morning. So three of those four are, are believers. You're just at a different place spiritually. You're either a little child or you're a young man, we can say a young woman, but a young man is what the Bible says, young men. Or you're a father, you can say a mother. So you're at one of those three stages in your Christian walk. It has nothing to do with age. It, it doesn't mean you turned 50, you became a father, a spiritual father. It's not based that way. Nor is being a little child based on, well, you're 13 or you're 9, so you're still a little child in, in the faith. It, it has nothing to do with your natural age. It has everything to do with where you're at spiritually, and there's a spiritual gauge here that we're going to see where all of us are at. But there is a fourth individual that's also listening to me this morning. You're also a child, but you're a child under wrath, and we're going to talk about this morning. My greatest concern as a pastor, especially the more I, I further my walk with God, and maybe you can say it the older I get, but the further I am with the Lord, I've come to the conclusion that many churches in America, people think they're saved and they're not. And unfortunately, we have so uh, maybe simplified believism that it's called easy believism that maybe we have so um, watered it down, if you will, that we have people that think they're saved and they're not. And we have so commercialized the gospel that anything that is the latest, the greatest trend that we think, well, if I do that as a church, that's what's going to grow our church. And so as a result, we have missed the mark in the very gospel, in the preaching of the gospel. So we have a lot of children under wrath in our congregations they think they're little children in God, little children in Christ. I'm a young believer. I'm a baby in the Lord. Maybe they even think they're young men, but they're still children, but they're children under wrath. They're not even saved yet. They think they are, but they're not saved. So there's four people that are listening, four kinds of people. So you're either a child under wrath. We call them unbelievers sometimes. We say uh, they've not accepted Christ. We use the words, they're lost. Then there's little children, there's young men, and there's fathers. Which one are you? Where are you at in your walk with God? Well, the Bible's going to answer that question for you. The first one is the children under wrath to the unredeemed, to the individual that doesn't know Christ. How do you know if you are saved? Really, you have to really ask yourself that question. How do you know where you're at spiritually? How do you know whether or not you are saved? Well, it all begins with this. It all begins with an acknowledgement first that you are a sinner. It, it all begins there. If you have not yet acknowledged your own sin, it's easy, especially in our generation, to blame your dad. Your, your dad was a distant father. You didn't have your dad. He walked out on you when you were three years old. It's easy to say it was my mom because she, you know, constantly pressured me about things, and, and so I rebelled against it. And, and I'm not saying those things aren't real. Of course, I know people walk through things. We all have a story. But you all and I have to come to the conclusion that I cannot blame others for my own sin. I can't justify my sin. I can't say, well, you know, I was just born a certain, you know, ethnicity. I was born in a certain part of the city, and I was raised in a neighborhood that wasn't very good. You know, my dad was this, and he was an alcoholic. And did it impact my life? Yes, right? We can all have our stories. 
But we all have to individualize our walk with God and say, I am a sinner, not based on all these other things, but my own choice, my own choosing. Then there's others that say, well, you know, I'm really not that bad of a person. I'm a pretty good person, right? I just have these little sins, but overall I'm a pretty good person. But you're still justifying your sin. You're still justifying your own actions. So if you do not acknowledge your sin, then you're walking in deception and the truth is not in you. Your mind is blinded to the things that pertain to God. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 8, it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you've not come to that conclusion in your walk with God, in other words, if you just said, well, yeah, you know, I raised my hand and I put my name on a little card. In fact, they even called me and they gave me a Bible. But if you haven't acknowledged your own sin and said, I was the one that that sinned, and we're going to talk about who you sinned against, but I was the one that sinned, then you are still in deception. You're still deceived. Then in verse number 10, it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar, and his word is not in us. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, it doesn't say whose eyes, it says whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not see or who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. What is sin? In the Bible, there's three words for sin. It's sin, iniquity, and transgression. And there's a difference between those words. The word sin, to simplify it, means to miss the mark. If you're a marksman, if you, um, if you go to a... Uh, a shooting, you know, you're going to go to a a range and you're going to shoot and you're, or if you're going to have a bow and an arrow, then you have a target. And so sin means to constantly miss the target. You're missing the bullseye. You're you're not even hitting uh, any of the target. You keep missing it over and over and over. That's sin. But also sin means to miss the scope of life. It means the very purpose that God created you. That if you don't even get that, my friend, you're still walking in darkness. If you don't even, if you haven't even stepped into the purpose, the only way you'll ever know your purpose is to come to the one that created you. And he begins to give you purpose and meaning and why you're living in the 21st century. So it means to miss the whole scope of life. The word iniquity means the very nature of sin, the character of sin. In other words, you were born a sinner. Nobody taught our children how to sin. We didn't say, okay, you're in third grade now. This is your class. You're going to learn how to sin. Nobody taught us how to sin. It was in our fallen nature. That's an iniquity. A transgression is a willful rebellion. It's where you willfully rebel. It's when God speaks or your conscience is speaking and you, 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 you silence that voice and you say, I'm going to do it anyway. It's a willful rebellion. That is a transgression. But sin can be summed up in these words. Sin is what I do against God. You have to begin there. Because if not, you're going to blame your dad, you're going to blame your mom, you're going to blame your sister, your brother, your children, you're going to blame life, your, your boss, you're going to blame everyone. And until you come to the conclusion that you are sinning against God, that is the beginning step. So David in the Old Testament uses the word sin, he uses the word iniquity, he uses the word transgression, all within a couple of verses in Psalms 51 and verse number 1. See, the thing is, David right here has, he has had someone murdered. He has committed adultery. And he didn't go around blame, blaming his father because really, if you read the narrative of, of David, it kind of seems like David is often left out. You know, his father, whenever Samuel comes and he has all the seven brothers and then uh, David is the eighth brother, he's overlooked. It, it comes to the point where Jesse says, Samuel says, well, 
Jesse, all these sons here, God hasn't picked them. Is there one more? Oh, oh yeah, there, there is one more. It's David. I mean, he could have said, I've been left out. I'm kind of the runt of the family. I'm the little brother in the family. He's the same one that is bringing the cheese and the bread to his brothers, and they are uh, rejecting him. He could have said, well, I have the spirit of rejection, and so I'm going to blame my brothers. That's why I had an affair. That's why I had committed this act of adultery. He could have blamed his father, Jesse, and said, well, it was my father, and that's why I had uh, this individual murdered and killed so I could have his wife. But he said, no. He starts off in Psalms 51 and 1. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. He says, blot or wipe out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Right there, transgressions, iniquity, sin. In verse number 3, he says, for I acknowledge my transgressions. I acknowledge my sin is always before me and against you, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And until evangelism in America becomes this, that I have sinned against God, we will not see the true conversion that a person needs. That until you come face to face with God and say it was, I sinned against you, See, our sins are not forgiven because you joined a church. Your sins are not forgiven because you were raised in the Methodist church or in the Baptist church or in the Presbyterian church or maybe even in the Spirit-filled Pentecostal churches. That does not mean that your sins have been forgiven. Being a good person does not mean you are saved. You can say, I work hard and I keep the rules and I'm a good student, I'm a good worker. No, like David, you have to acknowledge your sin. You just have to say, God, against you and you only have I sinned. Have mercy upon me. So it begins by acknowledging your sin, your sinful nature. And that will lead, that's the beginning point. It first starts off with an acknowledgement. It's not my dad's fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's my own. I made that decision. I chose that path. I willfully rebelled. It was in my nature, something inside of me. Even though my conscience might have been saying something else, but I chose it. Nobody forced me to do that. It all begins there. So the acknowledgement of your sins then position you to be forgiven. So let's just say here is the position to be forgiven. But if you're still here and you're still blaming everybody else for your life, you haven't acknowledged your position. You're still a child under wrath is what the Bible calls you. It has everything to do with position. And so you have to now submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. You have to submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. You have to humble yourself before the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. If I can have a water there, Sarah, please. Ephesians 2 and verse number 1, it says, And you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course or the pattern of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air or the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath or children under wrath just as the rest, but God, but God. Have you had a but God moment where he comes and he steps into the eternity of your life? Or are you still walking according to the course of this world? We're going to talk about that. But if your life has not changed and your lifestyle has not changed and you're still having affairs after affairs after affairs on your wife or on your husband, then my friend, I would really venture to guess whether or not you are truly saved because your, your life has not changed. I know that's a strong statement. I understand about grace, but I am telling you that we've had such an easy believism. That's why the church has gotten so weak. And so we need people to really ask yourself, am I really saved? Is there really a conversion in my life? Again, I'm not talking about you slip up every now and then. That's not what I'm talking about. If you continually, perpetually have continued to walk in the old way you used to walk, 
then you're still walking in darkness and you're living a lie and you're still deceived. But when there's this moment of but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. James chapter 4, verse number 7 says, submit yourselves there then to God. That's where it all begins. You can resist the devil, but if all you're doing is resisting and not submitting to God, you're not really resisting. You think you are. It all begins with submitting yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, then he will flee. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, well. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This morning, this part of the message is for those that are still under wrath. You're not saved yet. You think you are, and maybe you really think you are, but you're still a child under wrath because of your position. You've not yet humbled yourself. You've not truly humbled yourself before the Lord. So how do you know that you're saved? You confess your sins. You ask for forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So my father was a drug addict, and he spent four years in the state penitentiary there in Huntsville, Texas. So I can talk this morning. And so, you know, he came to know Christ when he was 35 years of age. He went to reform school when he was 12 years of age, smoked marijuana when he was like 11 he was doing heroin by the time he was in his late 18. Him and my mom got married whenever my dad was 19 and my mom was 15. She'd never been around all that and didn't even know what drugs were. Didn't know Christ. Didn't know, he didn't, I mean, raised as a Catholic. I was christened as a, as a Catholic little baby. You know, I mean, we were, we were around Catholicism, but we had not had an encounter with the living God. But what happened with my dad is he had a true conversion. He, he, he gave his life to Christ. There was a day where he said, I surrender my life. And in a nutshell, my mom prayed for him for about four or five years. She came to know Christ first, and she began to pray and, and, and say, Lord, let him come to know you. Bring him to his knees. And finally, she got fed up with his mess. And my mom was a very strong uh, individual. And she just told him, she said, Henry, well, you have a choice. You can either choose your drugs or your family. And, and he knew my mom meant business. He did. And so it was, he was left with an ultimatum, and he finally said, okay, I'll, 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 wherever you're going, I'll, I'll go visit with you. And so that morning, somebody's preaching not an easy believism, but preaching a message that says you need the Lord Jesus Christ to come and forgive you of all your sins because you have had a life without God. You've gone and done your own thing, but you need to cry out to God for the forgiveness of your sins, and he'll come, and he'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And the Holy Spirit was moving on those words, and my dad was feeling it that Sunday morning, but he said, not today, not right now. And just how Satan works, that afternoon, some people come and offer my dad drugs free today. Today, I mean, that never happens, but here you go. We have some drugs for you. But there was something about that, that message that continued to play in my dad's mind. And he kept thinking, and so he took the drugs, and they left, and he goes, and he couldn't take them. So he flushes it down the toilet, and that church had a Sunday night service. And he said, I, I want to go again. And so he went, and there my dad came from a home, you didn't show emotions. There's a lot of the older Hispanic community men didn't show emotions. It was just a very, it was about being uh, not very uh, less emotions. And, but that day, he just, that night, he just cried and said, God, forgive me. Forgive me, God. Forgive me. It was him and God, just him and, and God. And God radically transformed his life for him to never go back to a life of drugs, never to go back to alcohol. And that's what I'm saying because when the light shines in the darkness, it, it transforms, it changes. It's something God working on the inside of you. 
So my dad ends up becoming an elder in the church. He was, he was a missionary to Honduras and to Panama and to China and to Vietnam and began to smuggle in Bibles. My dad used to smuggle drugs, and now he's smuggling Bibles into China, all because he had an encounter with the living God. Somebody told him that day, you're a children under wrath. You're a child that will have to stand before the living God one day, and you will have to stand before God and give account to the entirety of your life. And he said, I give my life to you. You no longer practice sin. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 9, out of the Amplified Version of the Bible, it says this, Do you not know that, un that the unrighteous will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? He says, don't be deceived neither the sexually immoral. Now, again, this is those that are practicing, that continue to live this life. There hasn't been a change. So they, 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 he says, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor those who participate in homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, those who use words as weapons to abuse, insult, humiliate, intimidate, or slander, nor swindlers, those that cheat, a person who uses deception to deprive, fraud will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, is what he says. He says, and such were some of you. That's your old life. You haven't continued on in that life because you had a transformation. And such were some of you. But the reason we don't see people get saved in our churches is we're still living the way they are. But we carry the title of Christian. And they say, I want no part of it. If you have a gospel that has no power to transform, you're just like I am. He says, and such were some of you before you believed. But you were washed. Thank you, Jesus. You were washed by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. You were sanctified. To miss the mark, to miss the scope of life. But his sanctification came and it said to you, you are set apart for a sacred and holy use. If nobody has ever told you those words here at this morning, you have been set apart by God for something sacred, something holy, something incredible, a part of God's plan and purpose on this earth. So you were washed, you were sanctified. Oh, this is one of my favorite words in the Bible. You were justified. When I was a child, as a little Baptist, they used to teach us these words, justification, just as if I had never sinned. Thank you for the blood. So whenever you've given your life to Christ, as my dad got older, he didn't want to share his testimony because he was so ashamed of all the things he had done in his life. And it's just like as he got older, he was so ashamed. He would say, I, I wish I would have known Christ when I was younger. Can I tell you this this morning? Whenever his blood comes, he washes you. You get a clean slate as if you never lived a life of drugs, as if you never were in those kinds of relationships, as if you were never a part of something wicked or something unholy. It literally is a new creation, a new beginning, more than a fresh start. It's a new start. It's something that has never happened in your life before. So you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, declared free of guilt in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of God, the source of the believer's new life and changed behavior. See, wherever God's light shines, there's always two results. Number one is this, the blood of Jesus cleanses me. And 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Because my position now, it's my wife has been saying it for a while, it depends on this, with, with the night and the darkness, it depends on your position to the sun. So as a child of wrath, I'm still in darkness, but whenever I step into his light, then now he says the blood of Jesus cleanses me. The second thing that happens when his light shines is that I have fellowship with, with you. You have fellowship with the people of God. 
You, you desire the people of God. See, God uses this. He uses the word of God as a knife, if you will, and he cuts off different areas of your life, the, the, the bad, the, the bad attitudes, the, 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 the things that, that, you know, that we have in our life. He uses that, so it's a, it brings a holy conviction to us. Then he uses people, and he uses the people of God. He uses the people of God kind of like I have a desk back there and, and I had some, some water stains. I thought, ah, I'll have a little project and I'll, I'll sand it down. Well, a little project turned into a big project, right? So here I am sanding it down. Well, that's what happens. It's the people of God. They, they sand you down to make you smooth and take off some of the varnish and the veneer that we all have had. And they come and they, they wipe those areas of your life. They hold you accountable, they check on you, and they, they, they think about you, and they pray for you, and they strengthen you, and they make you laugh, and you, you enjoy the presence of God, and you share a scripture. And they said, I was thinking that same scripture today. And then they said, I had a dream. He said, well, I have the interpretation. You grow, and you're building, and you're growing in your faith. We need the people of God. So this morning to anyone here, and then I'm going to go into the little children, but anyone here, if you're, or those listening, if you're still a child under wrath, then submit yourselves under the mighty hand of God and acknowledge your own sin and say, God, against you and you only have I sinned. Come and forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me, I made a wreck of my life. Every choice, every wrong decision, everything that I hurt my family with, and I hurt myself. I come before you, God, and I say, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me, God. I was wrong. It was in my nature, God. I need you to come. I needed you to transform me, to change me, to save me, to forgive me, to cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. I submit myself to you. It's as simple as that. There's something about a whole heart. It's more than just words. It's where your heart is in it. It's where you're saying, God, I humble myself. The second one is the little children. After you come to know Christ, you're a little child. This is how you know you're a little child. You know that your sins are forgiven. You know that your sins are forgiven. That's what he says. In 1 John 2, 12, he says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And then he says at the end of 13, I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. In other words, you know you're saved. You know that you're, because you know whenever you had that moment with you and the Lord, you know, I gave it all. I surrendered all. It wasn't a, trying to cut a deal. God, I'll, I'll give my life to you if you fix all this. It wasn't that kind of deal. It was, it was Jesus plus nothing. It was Jesus meaning everything to you. And he says, a little child, you will know that you're, you're saved. You'll know that your sins are forgiven, and you'll know him as Heavenly Father. So during this time, you begin to, you grow in your faith. These are the growing years. Think about how much of a, a, a little baby grows. We have this, these little cute little kids over here. You know, this morning, I'm up there helping. We're trying a new uh, sound system and a camera and all these things. We're trying to get it to go, and I'm seeing these little kids, and they're, I'm just bringing me such such joy to see little Josh with that that flag and and you know he's going to grow and he's going to grow a lot quicker than we are as far as physically, you know if you don't see him for another two to three months he's he's going to grow maybe an inch or two and he's going to look a little different, and then you know right now he's I don't know 14 15 months old a year from now he'll be in his twos and then a couple years from now he'll be a five year old and. It's like that's what happens in your spiritual walk. You grow uh, exponentially. You grow quickly. You, you're absor absorbing all the, that God is saying, and you have this hunger, and you have this passion and this fervor for God, and you're growing. It's a beautiful thing. So continue on in the faith. I'm telling you, as somebody that has been serving the Lord for a long time, I love the Lord. I do. I love God. I abide in his presence. I long to be in his presence. I love to pray. I love to read his word. It brings me life and joy, and I see new things, and I, I love it. It's called abiding in the vine. 
So in 1 John 2, 17, it says, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, this is, the, this is to all those that are little children in here and those that are watching this morning, to all the little children, this is the word of the Lord to you. He says, little children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and know, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Let's talk a little bit about this Antichrist spirit. So you have Antichrist, you have Pseudo-Christ, okay, which is pseudo is a false. And so an Antichrist is an, it's, and being antagonistic, an enemy of anything that is Christ. So it's not, if you're looking for, you know, a future Antichrist and that's all that comes to your mind, there, there's so much more than that. And guess why he says the, this Antichrist spirit's already work, it's already at work and it's antagonistic. And he says, let me give, take it a step further. It's not out there outside the church, it's within the church. And it's antagonistic. This whole easy believism is an example of something that's antagonistic to Christ. Because people continue on in their bondage and he's there to bring freedom to them, but they really think they're saved and they continue on in their life. That's a, a form or an example of an antichrist spirit. It's, 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 it's uh, ungodly doctrine. It's, it's uh, a doctrine that is not truth. It's a doctrine based on a lie. And so he says, anything that opposes the father and the son, the nature of the father, the nature of the son, love, joy, Peace, patience. So if it's confusion, for example, that's not of the Lord. He said he's not the author of confusion. So if, it's, if a doctrine is bringing a lot of confusion, my friend, there's a good chance that that has come, and it's a, a form of the spirit of Antichrist. It's antagonistic to the things of God. 1 John 4, 2 says this, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and, now already, and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So from those passages, this is what he's saying. In the first one, he uses the word abide. The second one, he's saying who is in you, which is Christ. This is what Satan does in that first stage of the, when you're still a little child. You keep questioning whether or not I'm saved. Am I saved? Am I really saved? And so he tries to throw these thoughts. You're not really saved. You're not really saved. And you think, but no, I, I really gave my life to Christ. But you have to abide. You know what the word abide means? It means without intermission. So, you know, there's these long, they don't do it like they used to years ago, but they would have, um, you know, these longer productions or these longer movies. And they would actually have an intermission in between that because it was so long. It was three hours, three and a half hours long. You think, I mean, I need a break somewhere in there. And he's saying, that's what he's saying to don't take a break from God. Don't, don't, don't take a vacation from God. Don't take these moments. You think, well, you know, right now I'm just going to take a break from my faith. And that's what he's saying. If you're going to be a young man in the things of God as a little child, it's real simple. He's just saying real simple things for you. Abide. Abide in the word of God. Abide in fellowship with one another. Abide in him. Abide in your prayers. Abide in getting to know the Lord more. And then he says, then a revelation is going to come to you that greater is he that's within you than he that is in the world. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 24, and I need to hurry up, but in the next couple of verses, he uses the word abide five times. Five times. He says, therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, 
and you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as, as it has taught you, you will abide in him. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 24. 1 John 2, 24 through 27. It uses the word abide five times. To continue, to remain without intermission, to stay on until the end. See, there are two appearances of Christ. The first one, and that was the greatest event in world history. The first coming of Christ was what we know in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the first coming of Christ was to take away our sins. The second coming of Christ is to take away the saints so that we can be in the presence of God. See, there will be a second coming. In like manner, he will come back. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the, of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. See, when the, I'll, I'll just end here. We can continue with the young men and the, the fathers in the future. But there's three responses to the coming of Christ when he comes the second time. It's what my wife said. To those that don't know him, they're still children under wrath. The first one is those that are not prepared for his coming. They, they, they haven't made themselves ready. They're not prepared. Matthew 24, 42 says, therefore be on the alert, for you don't, do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into for this reason, you must be ready as well, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. That's all for the children under wrath. It's what my wife said. There's a scripture in Thessalonians talks about we know, we know. We know to us it, it won't be something that we're unaware. We know he won't come as a thief in the night to us. But This is speaking to the people that don't know the Lord. They don't discern the times and the seasons that we're living in. They keep pushing it off. Well, maybe one day, one day, one day, one day. The world will not be prepared or ready for his coming. This is another group, and this group will be ashamed. The, the ashamed are those that did not abide in Christ. These are believers, but they didn't continue on. They took breaks in God. They took a vacation from God. They said, I... God, it's too hard to be a Christian. And so he just took a break. He so said, I'm not going to continue on in the faith. So you haven't continued to abide in the vine. See, the remedy to cold love is abiding. You'll never have a cold heart towards God if you continue to abide. It, it is impossible. That is the remedy of cold love. The remedy of being a lukewarm Christian is I've abide, I'm abiding in the vine. I'm, I'm right there next to him. It's what John, the one that he would say over and over, the, the one whom Jesus loves, the one whom Jesus loves. It was always his position. His position was he was always at the bosom of Jesus, right there at his chest. He was always there. He wanted to hear the heartbeat of God. It was his position. And this is the same one that we're reading in John. He's the same one that, that, that has written these books about him being light and also about him being love. So this group will be ashamed, and they'll be ashamed because they did not abide in Christ. Mark 8.38 says this, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed 
when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And there's another group, and this is the group that has made themselves ready. They did not lose their first love. Revelation 19.7. Revelation 19.7. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. This is for you, just for further study, in case I don't finish this message in the future. The young men are those that have overcome the wicked one. They've overcome the wicked one. They've overcome, uh, they, they, they've, 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 uh, continued on even when the heat of the battle was was strong against them. They didn't give up. They continued on, and you could read that in First John, chapter two, verses thirteen and fourteen. It says, "Young men, because you have overcome the wicked one." It says that two times. And the fathers are those that know God. That's what he says. To the fathers, he says, in First John chapter two, verses thirteen and verses fourteen. It says, because you've known him who is from the beginning. They, they know God. That's how you know you're a spiritual father or mother in the faith. You know God. You know the character of God. So my wife, was, so she's able to discern what is the will of God at this time because she knows God. It's not based on other information. What is, what is the courts of heaven saying? Why don't you stand this morning? I want to pray with you and pray for you. Praise God. I'm going to lead a prayer of salvation for those here and those that are watching uh, this morning. If you are listening to the words this morning, this is what the Lord is saying to you. My arms are wide open. My arms are wide open. I will not reject you. I'll not turn you away. Don't try to clean yourself up and say, well, let me kind of stop doing this and stop doing that. And once I stop doing that, then, then I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. He's saying to you, it'll never happen. But his arms are wide open. And so what starts off is you walking. Next thing you know, you find yourself running to God. Oh, and then there's a holy embrace, and he takes you in his arms. And the tears begin to stream down your face. Because there's something incredible when unholy touches holy. There's something incredible when you have an encounter with the holy God. You begin to say, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. You begin to now have an examination of your own life and how much you've missed the mark, how much there's been willful rebellion in your life, how much of a sinful nature you've had. And then the next thing you know, you fall to your knees and you say, God, I give my life to you. Forgive me. Forgive me, God. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me, God, of every wrong that I ever did to any person. Forgive me for the wrongs that I did to my children and my family. Forgive me for the wrongs that I did to my parents. Forgive me, God. Forgive me. And somewhere in between those words, his love is just there. And he begins to wash you wide as snow and the burden that you carried and the weight that you carried in your life that backpack that was so heavy the backpack of sin and now taken off of you and you are free you are free you are free from sin you are free and such were some of you never to go back to your old life, never go to go back to your old ways. You are free because you had an encounter with the one that can set you free. And then he begins to put you back together again. And he begins to nourish you with his word. And you begin to grow in the faith. And you begin to know him. And you join in with Paul and you say, I want to know God. I don't want to just know about you. I want to know you, God. I want to fellowship with you. If it means I have to suffer, I will fellowship with you even in the sufferings. 
If it means I might find myself being made conformable to the likeness of your death, then Lord, I want to know you in every dimension of who you are. And God begins to put your life together again. And he forgives you and he gives you a new beginning. You are a new creation in Christ. It's as simple as that. Just give your life to him this morning. Father, I pray for our congregation and those watching today. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen their faith, Lord. Lord, that we can continue to fight the good fight of faith, God, because we have the Lord on our side. It is the Lord on our side, God, the God that does the impossible, the God that still works miracles, the God that with nothing shall be impossible for our God, the God that changes nations, the God that turns it all around, Lord. That is who we are declaring, God. You have, inf- you have already, you are victorious, God. And as my wife said it this morning, we are here to enforce the victory, God. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. Lord, just bring it all to the surface, God. Bring it all, Lord, all the dross. We thank you, Father. Lord, we pray for the time in the midst of this pandemic. Lord, we pray for a hedge of protection over our health, that no sickness would come near our dwelling, no sickness would come near our bodies, God, nor no sickness would come near our homes, God. We pray for a hedge of protection, Father. And we pray for those that are struggling in their health right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, be made well, be strengthened in your body by the power and the authority and the anointing of God. Be made well and be strengthened in the name of Jesus. We thank you. Amen. Let's sing. And after this song, you guys can be dismissed. God bless you. Come to the altar, the Father's arms 